How much of a serious problem are we facing? I, I think it's incredibly serious. When I look at my kids, I'm really worried about their kids. You know, I think it's, it really is catastrophic. You know, the, 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 the warming trend is there. The extreme weather, the predictions are much more extreme weathers, uh, droughts, floods, unreliable rainfall. The next generation, I mean, we're already facing those kinds of issues already in terms of extreme, strange weather and extreme events, but the next generation is really going to find it tough and the world is not taking it seriously in cutting down greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. Are we to blame governments in the world or are we to blame ourselves? I think, uh, I mean, it's a really a problem that national interests are still much higher than any interest at a global level. Don't you mean financial interests more than national interests? And, and right behind that is the political economy and the economy is the, is the real crucial piece. So it, the, really that's becoming our enemy uh, instead of helping us. So a few get rich and a few a lot get hungry. That's, I mean, that's exactly the case, yeah. And, and it's, you can also see the difficulty of coming together to try and broker global uh, negotiations and, and conventions. It really is a tough environment because countries come from such different perspectives, feeling that they've been the ones done in by another country for doing greenhouse gas emissions in the past. Do you think that conferences such as the one we're at at the moment lend to Africa joining us here as partners or do they sit aside and say how arrogant the South Africans mm. are down below is telling us what to do? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think, unfortunately, there's always an element of that. So within this particular conference and this community, South Africa is taking a leadership role, which is fantastic. So, for example, it's coming together with the United States, the Netherlands and Vietnam in putting together this kind of consortium. And then within this, uh, and this particular conference has the most African c participation. So, uh, you know, there is that leadership role happening, but there is always the, the issue of jealousy and those kinds of issues. Which is petty, really, and rather destructive, isn't it? It's true, and, but then South Af the, the leaders in the South African context also have to understand that that's there and do partnership, uh, the ways they do partnership appropriately. Well, let's talk about neighbours here, because you spent many years in Zimbabwe, where there's been land seizure, there's been... Uh, <coughs> a failure to produce enough food for its people. Well, could we see that kind of scenario in South Africa? And uh, in my opinion, that would be the death of South mm. Africa if mm. were we to suffer mm. that situation. Mm. How destructive of, was that in your time there? Yeah. Uh, so I was 20 years in Zimbabwe and teaching at the University of Zimbabwe and doing research. And I've still got relatives in Zimbabwe. and. For me, the, what happened in Zimbabwe is totally destructive. It's destroyed the economy. Uh, the tw in the 20 years, of tr I've trained so many people to PhD level. Almost none of them are in Zimbabwe. They're all scattered everywhere else. Uh, so it's destroyed the human capital. Um, uh, you know, perhaps it can pick up, but it's quite difficult to see. You moved from there and went to Indonesia. What's the farming situation like in, 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 in yeah. that part of the world? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess for, for when I first went to Asia, I was amazed by the energy and the vibrancy of the economy. And, and, uh, and that's what Indonesia is. It's growing enormously fast and rice production, fantastic. So there's lots of problems again, but it's just so totally different from the African context. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. I don't see conglomerates in that part of the world. I see small farmers. There are many in this country who would like to see small up-and-coming farming working in this country. Mm. Yet we're told that economically it doesn't work because of the capital mm -hmm. intensification and investment that goes into farming mm -hmm. these days. Mm -hmm. Is that right or is that wrong? I think it's, uh, once again, there's never a right and a wrong. <laughs> so it's not so simple as that. So, for example, smallholder rice production, it can be highly productive. And you can have millions of smallholders producing for the nation. Vietnam is an example. It was food insecure, I can't remember, 20 years ago or something like that. Now it's a highly, very dense country with millions of smallholders and they're exporting rice. So a smallholder system works within a certain context. So some of my work in Indonesia, for example, 
was with, uh, uh, with cooperatives. And, um, and I was amazed by how well they were organized, mostly locally based, and these cooperatives were for scaling up the volumes so they could sell to large amounts and make more money, getting the inputs, and that was all locally organized. And within Indonesia, they are really important in terms of local organization. I hate to use the word because it's misinterpreted by many people, communistical. And mm -hmm. I don't mean that from the political point of view, but yeah. a commune system whereby they share uh, equipment, uh, they sell to a, a, a basic co-op. That is the system for small farmers in this country. Would okay. you agree with that? Um, As opposed to trying to struggle across on your own. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th there's definitely a role for organizations above a farm level. And, but of course, you, you can't, you know, it's really difficult to generalize because if it's a case of no rules at play in an organization where people just take rather than give, then you can imagine equipment being destroyed. And so they have to be really strong organizations with rules in place about what you can do and what you can't do in terms of equipment and sales and those sorts of things. I, I'm deliberately taking you down a path, and I think you can sense the path that I'm taking you down, <laughs> yeah. is, is that whatever we're doing now is not satisfying everybody. Yeah. We can't take farms away from farmers because we lose a lot of food growth, yeah. which we have to have. Yeah. But we have to satisfy the previously disadvantaged. Yeah. Government has land it can give away. Municipalities have land that they could give away to urban farming, for instance, yeah. which happens in other parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, is that the route that we've got to go to help these uh, aspiring farmers and create a bigger farming community and mm -hmm. therefore create more food? Yeah. Uh, so whatever you want to do, you, t you don't want to follow the Zimbabwean model. No. <laughs> but you have to, I think you really have to deal with land reform in a, in, a, in a positive manner. It has to be on the agenda. And if you look back at the Zimbabwe example, perhaps what happened is for 20 years, they never really dealt with the land issue. And therefore, it became very high on the political agenda. I'm going to stick you on the spot on this yeah. one. Are we really dealing with the land reform situation in South Africa? Um, Especially following the statement I made that we cannot afford to be taking productive farms yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. I, so now you are putting me on the spot. Um, I, would, I, I would say it, it, it would be very problematic if you if you started taking productive farms away but is it is it feasible within the south african context to grow a next generation of farmers which is is uh, is uh, uh, is across the society so those kinds of issues are there areas where a smallholder farmer situation would work for example close to cities where market gardens are needed and is it possible to stimulate a whole uh, uh, new generation of farmers in terms of those sorts of issues? There's places perhaps in the Eastern Cape where a particular commodity could be grown on an outgrower scheme where, where, where you engage an entire new generation of farmers in a real productive activities. So it's those looking for the the, the the places where it will really work. I'm going to throw another question mm -hmm. in the pot, that, which is a ticklish subject in some respect. It's called biofuels. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 some of the previous interviews I've done on this uh, conference have touched on biofuels. Mm -hmm. We cannot afford to take from the food chain to, to provide the biofuel necessity. Mm -hmm. Yet South Africa and Africa needs fuel. Mm -hmm. to, to, to survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a balancing act in some respects. Exactly, exactly. Do, yeah. you, do yeah. you have any advice on the, yeah. in that area? Yeah. I, I, I think it's feasible to, to, ha to imagine a biofuel industry and, and biofuels coming from the farming sector. Um, but it has to be very carefully managed so that it's not a case of subsidies to Biofuel production, which drives up the price of maize, for example, that's, that's unacceptable. I mean, in Zimbabwe, 
there, were, there was always ethanol production from sugarcane in specific locations where it made sense. And I think, I think that those sorts of issues, those, those kinds of systems are feasible. How do you see the next 10 years? So, um, I, 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 you know, I started off pessimistically, but I can also be quite optimistic in terms of I, I, I see people really working on interesting things. For example, farmers need information about weather. And there's a huge revolution in terms of mobile technology and getting forecasts to farmers. And those forecasts could come with agricultural information as well about appropriate seeds and fertilizers and all those sorts of things. So that's really interesting. There's insurance. In India, there's a national insurance company insures 12 million people on 40 crops. And these are very small, small, small holders as well are in part of that program. So it's a, it's a great success story. In Niger, which is a, one of the poorest countries in the world, there's an amazing success story in terms of 5 million hectares of area have been regenerated. The trees are growing on the areas. So I, you know, I think if we can build on some of these successes, we can, we can really tackle the issues.